Hello, and welcome to ATP Report on this very special anniversary week of 9-11. We have two very special expert guests I'm very honored to introduce to you today. First, Claire Lopez is an internationally recognized expert on terrorism. She's a writer and a frequent expert commentator on that subject an extensive background uh, representing the United States around the world, uh, especially being overseas with the CIA. Uh, our second terrific guest is Dr. Bill Warner. He's a former college professor, a prolific writer, and the creator of the theory of political Islam. Welcome, Claire, and welcome, Bill. Thank, Thank you, Barry. On the day, the day's Directly after 9-11, there was no doubt that Saudi Arabia and its citizens were behind the attack. I mean, quite frankly, uh, it was the home and the training ground for almost every single one of the hijackers. We did nothing to or about Saudi Arabia, and we went to war with Saddam Hussein. Um, millions of Americans, for the life of them, still can't understand how a war got justified with the one country who had almost nothing to do with it. Bill, what are your thoughts? Well, I don't really know, but I can't help but suspect that George Bush Jr. thought he could finish the job that George Bush Sr. started. Because if you were going to go to war, you needed to go to war against people who were actually harming us. And I mean, I didn't understand it the whole time it happened. I'm looking going, why are we doing this? Because none of it made sense to me. But I tell you, if you stay in this game very long, you'll run across a lot of things that don't make sense to you. As a matter of fact, you can become believers in things operating behind the camera. Absolutely. Which I now know is happening. And Claire? Barry, I'll, I'll jump in here really quickly to say that while yes, um, the regime then in Saudi Arabia was very deeply involved in the plotting uh, for 9-11, the one who actually went to Saudi Arabia in late 2000 and early 2001 to recruit the 15 out of the 19 hijackers who were Saudi was none other than the Hezbollah chieftain Imad Mugniya on orders from Iran, certainly with the acquiescence of, of the Saudi regime. But it was Imad Mugniya and Hezbollah who actually recruited those Saudi hijackers and then escorted them all over the Middle East, um, Iran, Beirut, Afghanistan, uh, for their training and uh, their operational briefing. That was Hezbollah on orders of Iran that did that. And yet, all the blood and treasure that was invested and left in the sands of Iraq to depose Saddam Hussein and destabilize the Middle East is still there where we killed a whole lot of people and destroyed a whole lot of lives that had nothing to do with 9-11. Well, I mean, there, there's, there is some connection, uh, and it's this, that uh, number one, of course, Saddam Hussein had invaded his neighbors on multiple occasions. He was a destabilizing force in the Middle East. He absolutely had weapons of mass destruction programs, a latent uh, nuclear program, but a very active biological and chemical warfare program. He absolutely did. And he had been harboring on Iraqi soil one Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, of course, fled Afghanistan in the battles of Tora Bora uh, after the defeat of al-Qaeda and Taliban there, made his way. How do you get from Afghanistan to Iraq? Across Iran, which helped him. The IRGC helped him. The Quds Force helped him. Then he went to northern Iraq, uh, where a, uh, an escape route had been planned for him, and a place had been planned for him ahead of time. They planned this way ahead. Uh, in northern uh, Iraq, Kurdistan uh, region, and Saddam Hussein allowed that to happen. So he had al-Qaeda on his soil as well, uh, with his certain knowledge if not acquiescence. So for all of those reasons, Saddam Hussein absolutely needed to be taken out. But what the Bush administration missed is that that was the Sunni balance of power against the Shiites in the Middle East. And by taking out the Sunni balance, the Sunni counterweight to the Shiites, 
but in doing nothing about the Shiites, maybe that was supposed to be a one-two, I don't know for sure. It, be, it, it never wound up a one-two. But by taking out the Sunnis, and Iraq, by the way, of course, we know is 60% Shiite, so it was majority Shiite, and then insisting on you know, democratic rule, that's why we're not a democracy, we're a republic, um, it enabled Iran. It, 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 it shifted the balance of power uh, to Iran in, in ways that are with us to this day. Oh, absolutely. Let's come home for a minute in our discussion. Uh, Dr. Bell, you've written quite a bit about the infiltration of the federal government by representatives and basically salespeople for Islam. And that's colored the, dis the description here of who the bad guys are. Um, from the perspective of the mainstream media, the bad people are the jihadis and the rest are all good people. Um, the radicals are the few and far between that have perverted Islam somehow. Um, our late good friend Phil Haney was working on blowing the whistle on this infiltration when he was assassinated. Um, what are your thoughts about those that are surrounding even today the government with a message that would probably scare many regular Americans to death? Well, let's talk about the infiltration because I was a personal victim of it. I used to write white papers for the FBI on issues dealing with Islamic doctrine. Well, I was told later by the man who was in charge of <coughs> FBI training <clears throat> that my papers were the last one purged by the Muslim Brotherhood under the direction of the Muslim Brotherhood. So I was distinctly impacted. He said, you were the last one. And we just said, look, these are statistical measures. He, they said, it is offensive to Islam, it must go. So we see this in many ways. Let me give you a way that we see this. General Stanley McChrystal, The Endless War in Afghanistan, wrote a, a paper which was supposed to be a strategic outline on how to win the war. Well, I got the redacted copy, and it was interesting in his paper, which is how to defeat Islam in Afghanistan. The word Islam, Muslim, and Jihad did not appear <clears throat> anywhere in this document. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you can't even say the words of your enemy in his own native language, how are you going to win? Yeah, that, that's been a common theme, actually, um, especially since Trump started running five years ago or so. He was the first one who said, I want to tell you who the enemy is. And he's been lambasted in the mainstream media ever since. So... The Saudi regime, as you both have said, especially Claire, seemed to have been involved in 9-11, not just being the birthplace of most of the hijackers, but since 9-11 has been moving towards the West. Um, obviously, Iran has not, nor has their proxy army Hezbollah. Um, we've just seen dramatic normalization uh, with the United Arab Emirates uh, becoming very friendly with Israel. The stories out of um, both the Middle East, especially Israel and the United States, are saying Bahrain, Oman, Morocco may follow along rather quickly. Um, a Muslim country today in uh, Southern Europe just announced uh, they're moving their embassy to Jerusalem. I'm talking about Serbia. Um, Maybe Saudi Arabia will come along. What they've done so far is they've opened their airspace to Israel for the first time. So the holy two, the big two holy sites in Saudi Arabia, uh, where they are the basis of at least Sunni Islam, are becoming friendlier with the West. But they're still Islamic. So is the UAE. And while you don't flog people and execute people as many as you used to in Saudi Arabia. Um, they're still devoutly, religiously Islamic. Um, is the radicalization that comes out of those places going to diminish? Or is it just PR in the press and behind the scenes, they're still making more hijackers? I think that what they're seeing here is just real politics. 
That's all it is. I have a concept called the gravity of Muhammad. That is, Islamic nations may move away from the Sharia, move away from the Sharia, but Muhammad is always there. The Sharia is always there, and they will slowly be drawn back into the orbit. I give you the example of Turkey, where Kemal Ataturk was purged, Turkey supposedly of Islam, but now then Erdogan is back and he views himself as the new caliph. So we have here a situation in which you can have real politics drag you out of your strict Sharia orbit, but there will come a time. Remember, we use time, for, we measure time with a watch. Muslims measure time by a calendar. So we're quick, oh this, oh that, we gotta have our results now. No, no, no. Time is long. The assurance that Syria will continue to grow is always there. So I would view things like this as all being very temporary. What do you think, Claire? Well, I, I, I do think that um, what, what is happening in the Middle East is literally tectonic plates moving that we never thought we would see. Um, but I have to agree with Bill that, that the reasons are not uh, because the regimes there have decided to abandon Islam in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I will say that with the rise to power of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, MBS as he's often called, uh, in Saudi Arabia, under, by the way, under the mentorship of Mohammed bin Zayed, who is the Crown Prince, but effective ruler uh, of the uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, with the rise to power of those two crown princes, um, things began to shift. Now, of course, um, they're shifting for a reason. Uh, and it's not because they woke up one day and, 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 and read Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence. It's because events in the Middle East propelled them, compelled them to, to, to what they're doing right now. Uh, number one, uh, it is the rise of Iran and its nuclear weapons program which they are very much afraid of. And the loose alignment of Iran with Qatar, which is directly across the Persian Gulf, very close uh, to Iran, and then loosely uh, third with, with Turkey. Um, so it is, it is a fear of, of that axis of jihad, as I sometimes call it. Uh, but it is also the realization that Israel is not the enemy of these countries, GCC countries for the most part, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, um, if, if we add Morocco from way out in the West, uh, another. But primarily GCC countries, they know uh, that Israel is not their enemy. And they want to benefit from Israeli technology in things like agriculture and medicine uh, and water management, uh, things like drip irrigation and desalinization of, of uh, the seas. Um, so they have decided, at least for right now, that it is more in their benefit to align with Israel than against it. Now, here's where I think the brilliance, really, of President Donald Trump comes in. Remember the first foreign trip he took after coming into office in 2017? May 2017, he goes to Riyadh. And there he addresses what I think of as the assembled mob bosses of the Sunni world. The Shiites didn't come, but the, the Sunnis were there. And at the orders of King Salman, who told them, you come, and President Trump spoke to them. And he spoke to them in my own mind, I mean, this is the way I think about it, as the capo de tutti capi, right? These are the mob bosses of the Sunni world. Trump goes in there, uh, who's, who has faced up to the mob in our own country, building hotels and casinos and places like New Jersey, New York, and he knows how to talk to mob bosses. And that's what he did. That is the beginning. That laid the groundwork for this new alliance that is coming. The second part of that was uh, in early uh, 2020 this year, when uh, the president's team rolled out finally its peace plan for the Middle East. Remember this? So long ago now, we, we hardly remember. But that peace plan um, that offered the Palestinians a, a, a generous pro, a program, uh, a, a generous offer, um, but I think they knew it would be rejected because the Palestinians reject everything. It doesn't matter. They reject it. That was a one-two punch, laying the groundwork in Riyadh with the Sunni leadership of the Islamic world, and then the beginning of sidelining the Palestinians who are left out now, uh, sidelined, and 
the development of this alignment against Iran. That is what the president has put together. I think it's significant. Uh, and I think that even if it is, as Bill says, uh, you know, a, just, just a blip in time uh, on, on a horizon of millennia, um, you take what you can get and, and you, you build on it. And you try to create facts on the ground that are difficult, if not uh, very difficult, to ever walk back. That's what they're doing right now. Well, let me jump in because as I listen to both of you, um, I want to point out the glaring differential, and that's the following. As Bill talks about it from a strict Islamic reading of the texts, they don't think about time over the next weeks or what happened today or the election, they, they're dealing with a long-term calendar. And under the strict doctrine of Islamic law, you don't make friends with your enemies, the Jews being the most prominent of those enemies. You might have a hudna, a temporary cessation of violence. It's not a peace treaty. It's just you're not making war right now. Um, from Bill's interpretation as what I'm listening to, the feel good, make nice between the UAE and maybe Bahrain and maybe Sudan and others with Israel uh, is because, well, there might be some benefit to them, but war will be inevitable and the conquering and liberation of Jerusalem would be inevitable. And on the other side, I'm hearing Claire say, well, there's a lot of stuff being passed around. They want the science. They want um, cooperation uh, with water and inventions and technology and certainly Israeli intelligence vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So how do we balance those two? Um, if I was Israeli and I was concerned about the long-term prospects for peace within the Middle East, what would I think? Jared Kushner said in the last several days, he expects every moderate Arab state, maybe 20 of them in the not too distant future to recognize and have relations with Israel. Is it BS or are they just gonna put aside their required religious necessity to conquer Israel, the home of the Jews? Bill, how do you read it? Well, I read it exactly as it is. That is, there are short-term gains which you're looking for, but I'm taking the long view. I'm saying, I'm saying like 100 years from now. So my time scale here is very different. By the way, I'd like to make one comment that Claire made when Trump talked to the Muslim leaders in, 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 Iran, in, in Saudi Arabia. There's only one thing that calls for respect from a Muslim according to the doctrine of Islam, and that is strength. That's the reason that we see so many people who pussyfoot around and smile and nervously try to submit to Islam and be nice and pleasant. They don't get any respect at all. Strength is the only thing they respect. But anyway, I think that right now they're willing to do what they need to do to get the job done today. But remember, the doctrine of Islam is permanent. It'll always be there. And sometime later, maybe in a century, it'll come back to it. So that's my, I'm very pessimistic because I've studied Islam now for 1400 years, this history. And it <clears throat> goes forward and forward may slow down, may stop for a while, but it always keeps on expanding. So I can say I have the greatest respect in the world for Muhammad, the world's greatest warrior. And part of that war, <clears throat> and part of that warness is simply patience. Bill, I think there's another uh, aspect of this that we might think about um, in this period that seems to be a relaxation of violent or kinetic jihad against the Jews, against Israel. It's because Israel is strong and they know that right now they cannot defeat it militarily. That is why Egypt made a peace treaty. That's why Jordan made a peace treaty. Both of those are way more limited uh, than what's going on with the UAE, which is normalization of relations, a much broader uh, concept uh, that includes all of those exchanges we talked about, ambassador and embassy and everything else. Uh, but, but here's a thought. Um, they may not be able to pursue violent kinetic jihad right now, but no, they can't give it up. It's their, it's doctrine. So what are they doing instead? I think what they're doing instead is pursuing the path of interfaith dialogue. 
I think that is the aspect of jihad, and it is, call it dawah, but it's an aspect of jihad, interfaith dialogue, uh, and we can see that the Emiratis are leaders in this, is the way they're going to pursue um, uh, the, the, the objectives and, and the commandments of, of Islam in this particular period. People may know that in Abu Dhabi, the, the capital of, of, of the UAE, uh, right now they are constructing a compound um, that's it's kind of circular and uh, it has a mosque and a church and a synagogue uh, on the compound. Um, you'll also notice that the UAE is the leader worldwide. So this is probably a decision taken at the level of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the 57 member head of state uh, 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 organization of all uh, Muslim governments in the world, 56 countries plus the Palestinian Authority. At that level, they probably took this decision that they will pursue interfaith dialogue because um, Christian congregations, leadership, uh, and, and Jewish congregations and leadership are so inexplicably, to me, inexplicably vulnerable to this, um, that, 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 that they are um, maybe thinking uh, they can make more inroads that way for right now while gaining all those benefits, all those goodies uh, that normalization of relationship uh, with Israel will bring to them for the moment. Well, Clara, I, I think your analysis is true and correct. I hope you're both wrong, but you're probably right. So I'm sad about that uh, from the perspective of someone who is a big supporter of Israel. But at the same time, um, I can't imagine major portions of that religion are getting thrown into the dumpster uh, for economic benefit because they're not talking about this lifetime, they're talking about eternity. And as you say, Bill, it's a long-term project. I wanna thank both of you for coming on today uh, in light of the fact that America will be remembering our dead and how the world changed. Uh, 19 years ago. Uh, Bill, tell people how they can find out about you and what you do, would you please? I have a website called politicalislam.com. You can see my videos, newsletters, books, the whole nine yards. And by the way, I don't really sell books. I teach, I use sell educational systems. There's designs for you to educate yourself so that you too can know what Muhammad said and did and understand the mind of Allah. Excellent. How about you, Claire? Where can people find you? Well, I don't yet have a website, but uh, you can find much of my writing, my videos, uh, and other presentations online at a couple of different websites. One is at theunitedwest.com, uh, and its partner, shariacrimestoppers.com. Um, I'm also posted up at the Citizens Commission on National Security, um, many of my uh, presentations are cross-posted uh, with Brandon Howes at worldviewweekend.com. Uh, and I am online on social media uh, at um, Claire M. Lopez on Twitter, on Parlay, and on Facebook, same my name. Um, and eventually, I uh, hope to have a website. And both of you are on americantruthproject.org and uh, we're very happy to have you. Uh, for those viewers out there that have not yet subscribed to our text message alert system, I would encourage you to take out your cell phone and type the word truth, T-R-U-T-H, and send it to 88202, push send. You'll be automatically subscribed to our free service that gets you brilliant insight like Dr. Bill and Claire's uh, joining us today on this show and all of our future stuff. We never charge for content. If you're a little more old fashioned, you can go to americantruthproject.org and sign up to be on our mailing list here, there and you'll get the same stuff for free in your email. For ATP Report, thanks for joining us today. I'm Barry Newsbaum.